Good morning. It's Pop again, Dennis Murray. Today is uh, Popcast 73, and it's called Nature's Wisdom, Part 23. <clears throat> Yesterday, we uh, were talking about guns and Bibles, the phrase that President Obama used when he was running for office the first time. Um, <clears throat> and it led into a discussion of uh, communal spirituality as being characteristic more of uh, the conservative side of the Great Divide. Um, uh, I want to remind again that um, I don't really think that conservative versus liberal is the, the right word to use for the Great Divide because there's an awful lot more than uh, politics involved. But you know, I've been trying to find a better phrase, and uh, one side or the other side of the Great Divide is, you know, um, probably not a, a, a better alternative. Um, so I'll keep being on the lookout for a better phrase. Um, but for the moment, I'm going to use liberal versus conservative for the Great Divide. And I do think that... Um, uh, this communal spirituality feature is a very, very important part. It's as important as uh, the uh, idea about restraint that we talked about 10 or 20 episodes ago um, um, and the idea of uh, uh, type bias uh, that we've been talking about in recent days. Um, I, I think that uh, our, we, our psychology calls us uh, towards each other and uh, gives us a sense of uh, awe inside us, which is, uh, you know, a sense of sacredness. Um, and because of the the tremendous challenges we face as as uh, being aware of our own death and the death of those we love and and of our own hate and the hate of others directed towards us and of the chance that we could fail to meet necessity in providing for ourselves and those we love and of the unfairness in the world, we very, very much have a psychology that craves the comfort of each other. And that comfort includes celebrating the spirituality that's the source of the energy we need to be able to live in the face of these uh, psychological threats um, that really feel like curses, but are actually part of our gifts, which was, you know, early in the series of podcasts, my, one of my points. Um, so I, I talked a little about that yesterday. Uh, you know, I've, I've just restated, you know, how I feel about it, um, but I, I, I want to develop the, how could we possibly have uh, communal spirituality on, on both sides of the divide, which would be a major contributor towards uh, taking the sting out of the divide, perhaps even ending the divide, um, you know, that along with the other things we've talked about that contribute to the divide, the type bias and the lack of restraint, um, you know, the intellectual arrogance uh, and the relative importance of the gift of each other versus all the other particular values. Um, so, you know, uh, how can we do that? Um, some of us are atheists and, of course, like everybody that's an interpretation of the uh, experience of awe, the, you know, the, at the heart of our psyche that we all have to experience. Um, there's, you know, it's essentially to say, well, there's no external reality to it, um, whether or not they're uh, willing to concede that there is a psychological reality to it is a very important separate point. Um, and again, with agnostics, those who are saying, well, I don't know whether there's an external reality to it. Um, I guess this harks back to, uh, uh, I need 
to stop, make a side point, because it's very relevant here, about the difference in worldview um, between science and um, our uh, larger psychology. Science is a very uh, is a worldview that has strict limits, and when statements are made in from the scientific worldview, things that can't be proven in a scientific manner are considered false, wrong, or disproven, depending on circumstances. So we so easily speak as if that objective only world is the world that we live in. But in fact, uh, we only live in that world when we're doing science. In the rest of life, which all of us, scientists included, um, live, um, then we live in a world where there's objective and subjective that are contributing to our worldview. And in that world, um, a number of things that aren't able to be held as valuable in the scientific world are held as quite valuable. So we have to be very careful about point of view. Um, and we can easily hear an atheist saying, well, there's, you know, there's no reality to all. And what he means is, objectively speaking, as if he were a scientist, there's no evidence uh, showing the existence of awe as a material um, uh, a material thing in the world, and therefore it doesn't exist. But um, we ask atheists uh, for the moment, uh, as we ask all of us for the moment, um, to use the different worldview uh, the one outside of science, and in that worldview, the psychological experience of all is quite real, even though uh, science may not be able to validate it because things in the interior of our psyche are outside the limits of science. The, just as we can't stand outside the universe and look in and make statements about the universe as if we were outside it. People have tried that. It does and, uh, you know, people have tried to prove everything that might be needed to live life from a scientific point of view. That doesn't work either. Um, so, in, in, you know, inside the, outside the world of science, in the rest of life, the larger slice of life that we all have to live, then in, in that point of view, atheists may be able to say, well, okay, yes, of course, um, there, there may well be some reality to this psychological intuitive experience that uh, I'm referring to by awe, a sense of the sacred in our psychology. And if we're not talking scientifically about, uh, if we're talking in a l larger sense where subjective values um, that have any kind of reasonableness to them uh, have to be given uh, some respect, then yes, I can appreciate why there's awe and why we should celebrate it together. And, and that would be true for agnostics and true for members of various religions that um, largely disagree with other religions uh, about a lot of details, the name of God that they may use in the rituals and procedures and the, the t you know, the uh, the way they personify God, if if they do, and how many personifications there may be in in a particular religion. I think the Hindus have something they call aspects of God, which are represented by a variety of physical appearances. Um, uh, and I, I, there's hundreds and hundreds. I think someone once said there's a thousand, um, but they're all considered aspects of God and. Um, so, you know, the, the psychological differences are very important. Um, but I do believe that if we keep in mind the difference between uh, the scientific point of view and the um, psychological point of view from which the rest of life is lived, uh, then uh, we can legitimately expect that atheists and agnostics 
can appreciate community spirituality and participate in it, um, even though they don't believe in the external uh, reality of uh, a divinity. Um, either they deny it, as in the case of atheists, or they simply don't affirm or deny it in the case of agnostics. But in both cases, they don't believe. Um, and, uh, you know, then there's those of us who think there may well be an external reality, but aren't willing to personify it. So we got it, just about everything under the sun in the way of um, how our individual personality filters the common intuitive experience of awe. Uh, but I still think we can celebrate the common intuitive experience of awe, um, so long as we realize we're operating in the psychological realm of life and not the scientific realm. And uh, so I, I think I talked about the difference between those two points of view uh, earlier in the podcast series or way back when, but it seems appropriate to bring it up at this point. So, uh, community of spirituality then, what happens if you are part, you know, you go to a, a community event and, um, uh, and a celebration of our uh, spirituality uh, pr begins uh, the event. Uh, for example, if you go to a NASCAR race, they always begin with a prayer and um, typically, uh, the name of Jesus is invoked, uh, though sometimes um, the uh, speaker prays to the Lord or to God. Um, but uh, typically, uh, the name of Jesus. So, you know, I've been to some NASCAR races. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a centrist liberal politically, and I'm a... I'm extremely open as far as, you know, the openness quotient goes, <laughs> you know, but my, one of my sons, Dennis Jr. and I have enjoyed going to these races together. And, uh, you know, you bring a, a six pack and some sandwiches and, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of time uh, just talking and enjoying and sharing something together. Uh, so, you know, I've, been there a lot of times for the common prayer that begins. And uh, I don't believe in the divinity of Jesus any longer, though I grew up believing in it. And uh, But I, I'm not at all uncomfortable because I'm able to feel very strongly that what we're celebrating together is a particular name of God given to it by some believers. Uh, and, but the, what's actually you know, being honored is a psychological reality that we all experience, uh, the sense of the sacred. And whether or not the sacred exists externally and whether this name or that name is the right name or whether it's not a person at all, doesn't really matter. What does matter is that we're comforting and supporting ourselves and each other and celebrating the gift of each other uh, and strengthening our uh, our energy to to live in the face of uh, of death and and hate and uh, necessity and unfairness, you know, by uh, uh, celebrating this uh, uh, incredible sense of the sacred. So I'm not at all uh, personally. I'm not offended by somebody doing the celebration in the name of the particular name of God that he uses or she uses. Um, uh, but it, that could be a problem for some of us. Some of the atheists or agnostics uh, might say, well, gee, uh, I can't join any community celebration because uh, most of the time the speakers insist on using the name of the God they believe in, and, and it takes it out of the psychological realm into the religious realm, and I, I don't go to that realm. And, and I think the answer is uh, two parts. Um, if the speaker is not able to uh, 
have the openness it takes to recognize that his belief is an interpretation of a psychological experience we all share, you know, then uh, we can't let type bias get in the way of sharing in the celebration. We who are able to do so can see uh, that there is a psychological uh, world and that in that world in which we all live all the time, except when we're doing science, um, the, rea the sacred is real. Um, it, it speaks a loud voice in our psyche and uh, uh, it's there all our lives as an underlayment and it is the source of our psychological energy. So we can celebrate it even with those whose openness quotient is relatively uh, a little too low to permit them to uh, uh, acknowledge that what we are all celebrating is a psychological event. We all experience the psychological spirituality that seems very real to us. Um, if the speaker needs to make it a celebration of the particular name of God that he or she uses, you know, then type bias can allow those of us who uh, are more able to be open to appreciate that we don't want to let the limit, the you know, relatively low openness quotient of some speakers interfere with our uh, celebration of the gift of each other. We don't want to let type bias interfere with the gift of each other. And, uh, and there's no reason at all, I was going to say there's no reason in God's universe, and, and under the circumstances that might be a little ironic, but there's no reason at all to forget that type bias gets in the way of the gift of each other, and that there's every right to be on every variety of quotient and openness scale that that there that that could be, you know I'm humongously open uh, most of the time about most things uh, though I can be a narrow-minded uh, individual pick your favorite uh, pejorative to go with individual narrow-minded blank individual pick pick the one you like because I, I I've lived it I've done it. Uh, I deserve it on occasion, but most of the time I'm pretty far out there on the openness scale. But I can, you know, see the wisdom and benefit, and nature's wisdom is plain to me, that there's lots of people that are very, very different from me on the openness scale, and it would be a big mistake for me to write them out of my life, to write them out of the gift of each other. Uh, so I think that that's part of what's going on when we talk about actually celebrating community spirituality, um, not every celebrant can be open enough to express that we're celebrating our psychological spirituality. Some may have to celebrate it in the form of the particular religious belief that they have. And, and the rest of us don't need to take offense uh, to that. Uh, because really none, none is intended. It would be nice for those people who are open enough to do so to pay respect to the differences among us by acknowledging that uh, our uh, religion comes from this incredible sense of the sacred in our psychology and that the details that one attaches to one's religion um, uh, are just how uh, we interpret this common experience and that we're celebrating both this common experience and all the various interpretations. We just happen, perhaps on occasion, to be focusing on one particular interpretation uh, for today's celebration. Uh, we, we can all live with that. Um, it's complicated, but I'll bet you if I keep working at this, I can find a better, shorter way to make my point without so many side things and interruptions, um, which is, you know, why I keep doing these podcasts. I'm a lot better at explaining some things than I was, you know, five years ago or two months ago. Um, and uh, it seems worth it to me to keep trying. Uh, okay, so I see we're getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
to a fair amount of time for today. I have a huge amount more things to talk about. Um, uh, I want to finish with uh, one more example. You know, Hillary s spoke of the deplorables uh, when in 2016 when she ran for office. And it was a big deal because a lot of people took the offense that she intended uh, to be taken. Um, she essentially exhibited type bias. The deplorables was her word for people who uh, uh, let me let me go back. Um, she exhibited more than type bias. She also exhibited it a lack of appreciation of the relative uh, importance of the gift of each other. So if your highest value is to be a gift to each other, to, to live as a gift to others, and, and to ex hope, because you know, our, uh, our energy is the energy of hope, to hope that others will live the gift of each other to you, you know, we talked about the great divide and there's no middle and we want to recreate the middle and you make a move, uh, a respectful move towards the other and hope that they reciprocate with the move towards you so the miracle of the expanding middle occurs and the middle of the room includes you both where you stand only one step in from the corner. So there's a lack of an appreciation of that, in my opinion, of, by Hillary in the use of the phrase deplorables. And I, I don't think it just slipped out of her mouth. As we talked about guns and Bibles from President Obama, uh, you don't want to judge somebody on one phrase. They have a long life. They have a lot of complicated features. You don't really know them or their life. But I think we know enough about Hillary to know that this wasn't just, you know, a, a single utterance that she didn't really own and she regrets having said um, and that, you know, she doesn't really believe on reflection. I think this was a fair point of view. From her point of view and what she seems to stand for is there are a set of values uh, that you must observe before I want to include you in the gift of each other. And I respectfully think that the gift of each other is higher than the values like um, uh, uh, that, that are characterized or the, that our value differences that are characterized by somebody being racist or somebody being homophobic or somebody uh, uh, having gender issues, you know, the role of women, et cetera. Um, and all of these things, uh, nativism, etc., if those things disqualify a person in your mind from being part of the gift of each other, you know, then I have to respectfully suggest that you need to re-examine. Because it appears to me that nature's wisdom here um, is that the, the greatest value is being a gift to each other. And all of those lesser values um, are uh, important uh, and need to be talked about, uh, but they're not disqualifying. You're still human. You're still alive. You're still, you know, able to be part of the gift of each other if you choose to be. Now, it may be that your behavior in general shows that you've chosen not to be a gift to each other. You've turned away from your own uh, psychological call uh, to be a gift to each other, a call from your spiritual uh, experience of awe. And, and you can do that. It's your right. And there will be a fair number of people in society who do do that. Um, in one way or another, they reject uh, the call to be a gift to each other and they set out to do harm to each other. Um, and, but it seems to me that of all of those particular social values, 
the highest one is the gift of each other. And um, if someone fails on all the, the other values, but still is trying to be a gift to each other in his own seemingly unwise fashion, um, then I think he has to be included. And we want to celebrate with him. We want to celebrate our communal spirituality. In, uh, so enough for today. You see the point. Uh, some of the things we've talked about in the past is sort of, you know, um, things setting up my point of view um, are contributing to the conversation and I really hadn't thought this through carefully enough and seen that those things needed to be brought up and talked about. So my apologies, this is definitely not the best uh, presentation I could make. I'll try to do better tomorrow. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.